Today, I am going to be talking about using life's manure for spiritual growth. Well, first of all, I am a Lama Sokram Yeshe, and I am the resident Lama at the Hay River KTC. There is no city or town of Hay River. We chose that name because it's more of an area. It's still a small area. I'm located about an hour from the Minnesota border and a little bit north of the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. But again, an hour into the western part of Wisconsin. Now, to begin with, I've got spiritual in the title. So I have a quote here by Galwan Karmapa. Spirituality should mean coming closer to yourself. When this happens, you become closer to others too. Spirituality should dismantle discrimination and labels, not shore them up. It should break, not create, barriers between people. So this is the way I'm using spirituality. And growth means change. It means we're going to investigate ourselves more deeply, see ourselves more clearly. And as a result, the more we know about ourselves, the more we know why we act and react the way we do, and the more control we have, or in a way, the opposite is true, the more freedom we have. People talk about their buttons getting pushed. And as we investigate deeper inside of our mind, we find that we are the ones that installed those buttons and that we can learn how to uninstall the buttons that keep getting pushed. So growth means letting go of the security of where you are now. It means leaving home. The seed never sees the flower. So if we are going to flower, we have to have the seed break and the plant grow from that. So we're developing character. We're becoming more honest with ourselves. As a result, we're letting our innate wisdom come to the surface. And we're developing, again, other innate qualities of compassion, loving kindness, patience, tolerance, mental stability, and so forth. So now the next is, what is manure? And I like that term because I used to be a hobby farmer, and I have 13 acres here, and I used to plant crops. I used to have horses and other farm animals. Before I was a Buddhist, I liked eating meat, and I would raise a lot of the meat that I would eat, including a beef, a chicken, pork, I would raise turkeys and so forth. Well, it was awfully hard on the animals because they all died, of course, except for the horses. I didn't eat horse meat. But anyway, all of them left manure that had to be disposed of some way or another. And the thing about manure is that it is a very rich resource for nutrients that plants use to grow. 
So this is why I use that word or term. If we look at the difficulties in life as the four-letter S word, it's a problem. If we look at difficulties in life as manure, we find we're rich in resources if we know how to use it properly. Actually, the difficulties in life are wonderful opportunities to grow, to learn. And we have the ability to choose. Are we going to look at life's difficulties as a problem or are we going to look at them as a resource? So here is a quote by Viktor Frankl, who was Jewish. He was in a number of concentration camps during the Second World War. And at the end of the war, he was alive, and he led a very productive life after that. Here is a quote. There are forces beyond your control that can take away everything you possess, except one thing, your freedom to choose how you will respond to the situation. So in life, our attitude is very important. It can seem almost like the most important thing. That if we can have the attitude of these difficulties in life, our opportunities rather than, oh, poor me, poor me, poor me. Why are things always going so badly in my life? I have used this example many, many, many times. Some of you will have heard this before, but I'm going to use it because it is so typical of the way our minds work friend of mine that moved out here because like me he wanted to be out in the country and have a more natural setting and he has a business in a little small town close by probably less than 500 people he has a motorcycle and a car he sometimes rides a bicycle to his business that he owns and he's a sole employee. He likes being by himself. And on his ride home one day, he saw a bag of trash in the middle of this country road. And he got extremely mad. He would describe this whole thing to me. And when he rode up close to the bag and got a look at it, he saw that it was a bag of fresh groceries. So instead of him being mad at people throwing trash out their windows as they're driving through the country and not giving a darn about anything, and now all of the anger was gone and he was happy because it was his bag of fresh groceries. It wasn't the universe's bag. It wasn't somebody who lost the bag of fresh groceries. It was now his bag of fresh groceries. He stops and uh, grabs it and gets on his bicycle and very quickly his happiness is gone because it's too big and bulky for him to carry and ride the bicycle at the same time. Now he's paranoid because if he leaves it, somebody might find it and it's still his bag of groceries. And so he hides it in the brush and gets on his bike and rides home very quickly again paranoid that it's going to be gone, gets in his car, comes back, goes and stops, goes into the brush, finds it. Now he's happy again and goes home because it's his bag of fresh groceries. And the bag just lay there the whole time. The bag did nothing. 
and all of these states were his own mind. And we do these sorts of things on a regular basis throughout the day that we project our, our various attitudes, our values, our, our history, our habitual patterns on whatever we do, run into during our day. The next that I want to talk about is we can do some gardening with this manure. And I'm just going to call this little metaphor here the garden of your mind. How to love yourself. In the garden of your mind, water the seeds of your qualities, such as loving kindness, compassion, and wisdom. Nourish these seeds and avoid watering your faults. Avoid encouraging and nourishing your faults. It's important to know the difference between a fault and a quality. It's easy to think that person needed for me to teach them a lesson. So it was a quality that I got mad at them and told them what I thought of them. Well, I doubt it. I doubt that really was a quality. It might have made you feel good, but did it really help that other person? So the next point is to pay attention to your mind. This is called mindfulness. What is your mind doing right now? It's very good every once in a while to just take, well, this is in sports, you know, take a time out. And, well, where is my mind right now? What's it doing? What's it thinking? How's it feeling? How come I keep going over this same problem over and over again and I'm mad? Or whatever. But the more attention we pay to our mind, the more we can start understanding ourselves, understanding what works, what doesn't work, and we start seeing more clearly. So to go on with this metaphor, nurture these qualities and fertilize them with the composted manure of your experience. And now, in case you don't know, all you have to do to compost manure is put it in a pile and then turn it every once in a while, and it gradually breaks down. If you're doing farming, and when I was doing farming, I just had a manure spreader and spread it out on the field, and it automatically works but manure whether it be our personal manure or actual physical manure it gets too strong if you put it on in large quantities in a small area so you have to realize what your abilities are and work according to your abilities again i had a a very difficult relationship with my mother who was mentally ill and had been sexually assaulted repeatedly as a little girl, which I did not know about. It was never talked about. But eventually, after practicing Buddhism, I realized that just spend a short period of time with her, and then I can work with that without doing things that I would later regret. Realize what your limitations are. It's good to push the limits, but again, gradually. To go on here, our faults will cast shade on 
our qualities and it'll steal nutrients from our qualities. So don't let the weeds grow. Don't let the faults grow. If you want to be, you might say on top of that. We want to uproot them. Again, if you have gardened, you know that if you just pull the tops of the weeds off and leave the roots in the ground, they will just sprout new growth. You have to uproot them if you want to really get rid of the weeds. Now, the next, this is something that I stress a lot about, and that is use your awareness to get to know your inner critic this voice inside that's telling you that you're a bad person, you're always doing things wrong, you're always screwing up. Using language that if you had a friend that talked to you like that, you would no longer be their friend. So... You want to get to know that inner critic that wants to punish you, wants to lecture you, is constantly telling you what's wrong and how you have screwed up, maybe makes you feel guilty and so forth. When I started recognizing my inner critic, I put a sign up on my kitchen bulletin board that said the beatings will continue until morale improves. And then in small letters, the management. And I did that because I realized that my inner critic was this manager that I had that somehow or another thought that if I just punished myself enough, told myself how bad I was, that I would somehow improve as opposed to what really happened was I just got more depressed and more angry at myself. So we need to get to know that inner critic rather than ignoring it, becoming distracted. Well, it's still going on and on and on. Uh, we need to make friends with it, to get to know it, to understand it. And then you realize that this friend is giving you bad advice and you don't have to follow it. You don't have to believe the content. Very simply, a flower will never grow to its potential if you walk on it, if you give up nurturing it, if you throw trash on it, and so forth, if you treat the flower like it's worthless. Of course, you will not have a mature flower in full bloom. It takes courage to do this because you have to give up the security of staying where you are. It's easy to feel safe in a little box, you might say, that we put ourselves in, that we only allow certain people in, maybe a pet or two in, and we just kind of wall ourselves off from the rest of the world. It is probably going to be a somewhat painful box that you put yourself in, but you feel that there is at least some security because it's familiar to you. However, on the other side of that is this freedom that I talked about earlier. There are more choices. There is more happiness. There is more 
contentment. There is a connection with the rest of the world and other people and so forth. There is inner harmony and there is outer harmony outside of that little box that we find ourselves in. And also there's wisdom there in this garden of our mind, wisdom that will guide us through our daily lives. And as we get to know ourselves better and better, we start, you could say, peeling off the layers that we hide behind, who we think we are or who we would like to think we are. We might find ourselves to be actually quite wonderful, not in an arrogant, prideful way, but more genuine, more well, to use a word we've all heard before, more awake, that you're more available to other people, you're more available to yourself, that you're actually experiencing things more closely. It is said that if you listen, you might hear something. If you don't listen, you don't hear anything. If you look, you might see something. Again, if you don't look, you're not going to see anything. Right now, I hear some birds outside the window that are, I'm not sure why they are chirping about, but they seem like they're having a good time. And I can look out the window and see other things besides the birds, their leaves and trees. The bright sun is out today, and yet it's a relatively cool day, which I like. And it's just a beautiful day here. And I suspect it's a beautiful day where you are, too. So then... The question is, who are we or you? Actually, who are we? Of course, from a Buddhist perspective, we have Buddha nature. We have, in terms of comparison to a Buddha, we have the potential to become a fully enlightened Buddha and that our potential is just as good as a Buddha the difference is that a fully enlightened Buddha has developed their qualities, their true nature. And so we have this possibility that it is not something that all other people can do that, but I can't. We have this possibility within us and that the qualities are kindness, caring for ourselves and others, kindness for ourselves, kindness for others, compassion, cheerfulness, being happy, having a positive self-image. All of this is right there in our mind. You might say waiting for us to experience it, to uncover it. And it's excellent to be motivated to benefit others. This is the Mahayana path. The Mahayana commitment to bodhicitta that I will practice, travel the path so that I can lead all beings to the same state as a Buddha. Now, for a lot of people, 
a surprisingly large number of people have experienced trauma, various kinds of trauma. And all you have to do is look at the news, what's been going on. Well, take your pick. Last week, last month, since the beginning of the year, take your pick. The news, of course, is almost always bad news. There's always somebody getting killed. There's always traffic accidents. There are people dying of various diseases and divorces. I don't want to go through everything, but it's easy to think that what you're experiencing is incredibly horrible and the worst thing that could possibly happen to you. But again, going back to Viktor Frankl, that you still have the freedom to choose. I like to, going back to Viktor Frankl, it seems the three choices that we have, and there might be more, but what I see is, A, you can be a victim. Take your pick what you want to be a victim of. You can be a victim of cancer. You can be a victim of a traumatic childhood. You can be a victim of a robbery. You can be a victim of people at work picking on you, and you're always the one that da-da-da-da-da. Uh, take your pick. Or you can be a survivor. Yeah, I've had these traumatic experiences in my life, but I survive. I'm a survivor. And I'm a Holocaust survivor. Well, I'm not sure exactly how Viktor Frankl saw himself, but I suspect he did not feel he was either of those. Because the third choice is well, I have had these traumatic experiences, but I'm not going to define myself on the basis of these traumatic experiences because I am not the sum of the worst things that have happened to me. If you call yourself a survivor or a victim, you're just saying, that's who I am. All of that happened in the past and you're living in the past, and there's no freedom. I am a retired prison chaplain, and there was one inmate that said, uh, well, I was sexually assaulted when I was a little boy, and there's nothing I can do about that. Well, he was, you might say, living in the past, because, of course, this happened in the past, and what we're really actually working with is our thoughts about what happened in the past. And our thoughts are happening in the present. And so how are you going to look at this? Are you going to say, well, there's nothing I can do about it, or I can work with my thoughts and have a very different view of this than I did when I was 10 years old or 20 years old, or 50 years old, if you're getting to be my age. 50 years old was still a long time in the past for me. The thing is, the past is past. There's nothing that you can do about it. And what you're actually working it with is your present thoughts about something that happened in the past. And it's easy to look at this differently. An incident that happened to me when I was a little boy that I thought it was horrible. I think I was second grade, third grade, and whatever mom said, that was the law. 
There was no way you could get her to change her mind. And she decided that Halloween, she would make me a bunny costume and I had to wear it to school all day long. And it was out of my pajamas that had the button flaps and back for sitting on the toilet. And I, I just had some bunny ears and I thought that I was just so embarrassed all day long, I had to wear this in front of my classmates and so forth. Now, I could live with that my whole life, but I didn't. And I came to realize that this is just all thought. And I'm going to bring up a picture here that I took, I went to Ecuador a few years ago and they had a parade there. And this one group in the parade, their theme was sanitation. There, you see that there's a little boy wearing a toilet and there's a little girl behind him that is a roll of toilet paper. Now, they were not embarrassed uh, do you suppose being embarrassed about wearing a bunny costume was all in my mind that there was another way to look at things? Are you getting a good look at that? The point is that we are looking from a point of view of our ego, and it isn't necessarily a very accurate point of view. And if you can look back at things that were traumatic, well, maybe there's another way to view it. Again, after my mother died, she lived in 96, by the way, I found out from a cousin of mine whose mother was my mother's sister that mom had been sexually assaulted repeatedly. And this made me see her behavior very differently. And I have run into this saying, and that is that hurt people hurt people. And a lot of time, the behavior that other people are engaging in that hurt other people come from a place of extreme pain for that person. that it's good to be mindful of our feelings and our fears instead of trying to avoid or if you're having fear, cover it up with busyness. Or there are other ways of covering up too, and that is using alcohol, drugs, compulsive behavior, and so forth. It's good to see exactly what is behind the fear. Again, here's a personal experience that I had. When I was the prison chaplain, I had an hour and 45 minute drive one way to get to work. I liked the job and I was willing to do that. And I would sometimes leave late in the morning so that I knew I would get to work late. And there was only one way into the prison and the warden's office had a window that looked out onto the parking lot. And frequently when I would walk in, he would wave to me. We were on good terms. So if I left late, I could spend an hour and 45 minutes worrying about arriving late. I could be late a hundred times in an hour and 45 minutes. I could probably, if I really worked at it, be late 500 times and worrying the whole time. When in actuality, I could only be late one time. And even then the warden might not see me. And if he did see me, he might not care. So the point is that how 
creative our minds are and how when they start going in a negative direction, they can get extremely creative. But if we can start seeing by being more mindful, by being paying more attention to what's going on in our minds, we start seeing these things and maybe develop an ability to let go a little bit. You know, it's that same old thing. Yeah, I'm tired of this. And also, the more we pay attention to what's going on inside, the less emotional turmoil we're having, and the more we're able to see about other people that we're interacting with, that we're able to see that just like us, they have buttons that get pushed, that they have problems, they have difficulties, and they're probably having a more difficult time than we are. Meditation is a wonderful practice when it comes to working with life's manure. If you have a regular practice, you slowly develop the ability to let go of thoughts. It doesn't come quickly. It isn't necessarily easy, but by just following the breath and then when thoughts arise and you realize that you are not following the breath, coming back, you develop this ability to let go, even if it's just a little bit. There was an inmate when I was working there that I taught meditation to, and he took to it like a duck to water. And he would meditate every day. I'm not sure how long he meditated, but he came down to the chapel area one day and he said, you know, there's a lot of suffering going on in this place, meaning the prison. And it's not just the inmates. His mind had calmed down to the point that he was seeing more clearly and he saw that the inmates were suffering and he saw that the guards, the social workers, the staff, that they were suffering too. And this is really, really important. The world is full of people that are confused, just like we are, and probably more confused because they're not practicing Buddhism or some other spiritual path. This is how getting to know yourself helps you get along with other people better. The more we know about ourselves, we kind of do, you might say, reverse engineering, if I can use a term here, that we see how we build up this idea of ego, who we are, what we want, what we think we are, who we think we are, and so forth. And we realized that, well, it's a fabrication. And then we start being able to see, well, other people are doing the same thing. No wonder why there's so much confusion in the world. Another misconception is samsara is supposed to be perfectible. You know, if we just have the right to scientific advances, maybe the right studies in psychology and, and so on and so forth, the right kind of doctoring and advances and so forth, that somehow or another things are going to be better. Well, I've got a pacemaker. I like my pacemaker. But doctors don't save lives, they prolong it. The pacemaker is just prolonging life a little bit. I like to compare my life with my grandmother's life. She grew up on a farm in Wisconsin. They had horses, they didn't have tractors and 
cars and pickups when she was a little girl. And she was really happy. And sure, she cried too. But when she talked to me about growing up, she just had nice stories to tell. There were one uh, that what maybe wasn't so nice. She had seven older brothers. And, and she would get into fights with those older brothers. And if she came to her father, he would spank both of them. So she had to learn to, you might say, fight like a boy with her brothers, and including taking a big stick and chasing him and hitting him. So I remember hearing her tell that story. And she grew up to be kind of a gentle fighter. Her husband died when he was 40 years old, and she took over the business, which was a mortuary, and grew the business. And her oldest son came on and continued growing. And she was very successful, both in terms of being a wonderful person, she was a leader in the community, leader in the church, leader in various civic organizations. She was really important to me in my life, and so on. Yet, nowadays, you don't have your cell phone if you lose your internet connection. Oh, my, you know, it's a disaster. All these things that did not exist before. They're nice, they're wonderful, and so forth. But you're right back to samsara. People get, you know, road rage because of a traffic jam or behavior of somebody. You're in a traffic jam, and that's the idea. I'm in a traffic jam, whereas you're part of a traffic jam. You're not separate from the traffic jam. You are the traffic jam. Just And the person in the car next to you, behind you, in front of you, they all think they're stuck in a traffic jam, but they're not part of it. It gets to be pretty ridiculous when you are able to see things a little more clearly. So... We need to calm down. We need to meditate, be mindful of our mind, paying attention how it works, where you might say our favorite buttons are that get pushed by people. It's really important. The more we know about ourselves, the more clarity that we have. And we want to have this intention of while well, we're doing this, that this is a discovery. Yes, we're going to see warts. We're going to see all kinds of things that we don't want to admit about ourselves. But it's helpful to do this. If you look at it like I'm supposed to be perfect and I keep seeing this crap coming up in my life that I do I'm a bad person. You're not going to learn anything. That's just more of the same old, same old. It's much better to say, oh, I'm glad I saw that. Now I can work on that. So it's excellent to contemplate what's going on inside, to not be afraid of what you think that it's fine if you find that your mind goes all kinds of negative places. And remind yourself, well, I don't have to go there. I've got choices. The more that you see these things, the more you are able to work with them. Here's an analogy that I like. Let's say you're in New York City. It's 11 o'clock at night. You want to take a bus. You're at a bus stop and maybe... Now, for me, I would be nervous in New York City, 11 o'clock at night. 
So here comes a bus. Now, do you get on the first bus or do you look at where it is going? Well, probably it would be best to look at where it's going before you decide to get on because it might be headed for an area you do not want to get off the bus at. So when you are going through your daily life and something comes up and you have a reaction, maybe step back. Where are my impulses leading? Do I want to go there? Or can't, would it be better if I step back and just let it pass and not do anything right off the bat. Give it some space, give it some time to look at it. When the Buddha was a child, his father tried to protect him from suffering. And you're probably familiar with the story. It worked up to a point, but then the Buddha became a man and he decided he wanted to see what the world outside of the palace walls really was like. And he took four different trips out into the city in the four different directions. And he saw that the world is full of suffering. His kingdom was full of suffering. So we try to do that with ourselves. We try to protect ourselves from suffering. We try to protect those close to us from suffering. And it's all fine and well to do that. But we also need to learn how to work with suffering. Because we're not going to be able to avoid it. That's the, the wonderful thing about looking at it as manure, because we always have plenty of it. The other day, I had to make some phone calls, and it was amazing. They were business calls, and it was amazing how many times I got to be on hold. One call after another, after another, leaving voicemails that were never responded to. Well, this is a good way to learn patience. If everything goes your way, how can you become more patient? It's really hard when everything going your way and uh, quickly, uh, oh yeah, yeah, sure you're going to learn how to be more patient. Um, that uh, all of this is uh, very important. There is a saying in the uh, seven points of mind training, always contemplate whatever causes resentment. And the reason why is very simply that resentment points to unrealistic expectations. Well, I was in the cities the other day, the Stillwater area and some other places, and I was amazed at how long some of the traffic lights were. Where I live, you have to drive about 25 minutes before you even get to a traffic light, and you have to be in the right direction or you could go longer. But... Uh, these traffic lights take forever. And, well, so what? Wait. Wait your turn. And this is the way life is. It is constantly presenting us with opportunities to practice patience, to point out unrealistic expectations that we have. Another area that it's really good to look into is blame. Blame is a worldly concern. It's one of the eight worldly dharmas. And we frequently play the victim and blame other people for why we're having difficulties. It's their fault. 
and you're giving up your responsibility to work with the situation if you're blaming others and calling yourself a victim. There's a connection between you and the other person or you and the situation. And again, you have the freedom to decide how you're going to view the situation, how you're going to work with it. You do have that power. And again, samsara will never be perfect. I've said that before, but it will never be perfect. No matter what you do, it will never be perfect. The other direction we go with blame is blaming ourselves. There's something fundamentally wrong with me. I always do the wrong thing, make the wrong decision, fail, and on and on and on. And that leaves you, of course, powerless because since you're fundamentally a bad person, there's nothing you can do about that. And this kind of approach, it's like looking at a, a lump of coal and thinking that you can't turn it white, so why try? When actually you're a diamond because of your Buddha nature. And thinking that samsara should be perfect, that's like looking at a lump of coal, thinking that it's a diamond. I hope this makes sense to you that we frequently look at samsara like it's supposed to be a diamond when it's actually a lump of coal and look at ourselves like we're a lump of coal when we're actually a diamond. We just get totally confused and flip this. So blame is a big problem. Here is a quote by Mingyur Rinpoche. When the underlying causes that produce and perpetuated an experience of happiness change, most people end up blaming either external conditions or themselves. However, because it reflects a loss of confidence in oneself or in the things we are taught to believe should bring us happiness, Blame only makes the search for happiness more difficult. I'm going to read that again. This is by Mingyur Rinpoche. When the underlying causes that produced and perpetuated an experience of happiness change, most people end up blaming either external conditions or themselves. However, because it reflects a loss of confidence in oneself or in the things we are taught to believe should bring us happiness, blame only makes the search for happiness more difficult. Needless to say, difficulties are bound to arise. Even serious ones are bound to arise. This is the nature of life. And maybe we can go for periods of time where serious difficulties don't arise. But if you think they shouldn't arise, why do you have insurance? Why do you have household insurance? Why do you have insurance on your car and health insurance and so forth? It's just amazing how we buy all of these different types of insurance and then bad things aren't supposed to happen. Difficult things aren't supposed to happen. Now, when you're blaming yourself, when difficulties arise, it's important to know the difference between guilt and remorse that guilt is going back to this, I'm a bad person. And guilt usually involves not only I've done this thing wrong, but I have this whole laundry list of things that I've done wrong that prove that I'm a bad person. 
and you go over these thoughts all day long, maybe all your life, about how you're a bad person. And remorse is, well, yes, I did this. I regret having done it. I can be better. I'm going to work on improving. So it's very, very important to, again, through introspection, by examination, to see how you are handling things. I remember a long, long time ago seeing an interview with a woman on television. It was one of these in-depth news programs, like 60 Minutes. There was a death, perhaps, of a child, and she said that she had blamed herself for that child's death for a very long time, and then suddenly she realized, I would rather feel responsible than powerless. And when she realized that she was powerless, the guilt disappeared. We can take too much responsibility. I'm going to go a little bit further, and then I want to open this up to questions and answers. We can learn from our mistakes. We don't have to be too responsible. I like this I have here in my notes. You have to see the dirt before you clean your house. If you don't see the dirt, it's not going to get cleaned. When we're going down this road of I'm a victim, I talked about, well, samsara isn't perfect and it never will be perfect. It's good to contemplate whatever causes resentment, irritation, that when we refuse to be a victim, we take the power back. A victim wants others to change their behavior. And the, here is an interesting situation that people get into. I know that I am right, and I'm not going to change my mind but this person here, they're wrong, and I have the ability to change their mind. And they're thinking, I'm right, I can't change my mind, but I'm going to change that person's mind. And then you go, they get into it, and nobody's mind changes, and but they just get angrier at each other. So with the, the victim mentality is, I'm right. I have to change your mind or else I just give up because it's hopeless. And you feel powerless and so forth. So we don't have the ability to prevent other people's behavior that... It's going to happen. People are not going to like what you do sometimes, what you say. They might not like what you wear if you dress like I do. If we can accept this, we can use uh, all of this as a way of developing more compassion for other people, more compassion for ourselves. We can become less defined by negative situations we've experienced to make a connection with our Buddha nature and our true human potential. So now I want to talk about some positive attitudes and positive feelings that if we have uh, a po positive feelings, if we have positive attitudes, this leads to happiness and contentment. And contentment means enjoying what you have in the present. 
it doesn't mean that you are not interested in improving, but it means that you can enjoy, well, weeds flowering in the cracks of the concrete, that you can enjoy hearing birds chirping or watching. I watch the squirrels a lot here. And on the other hand, they do like to chew into buildings and make nests and so forth. So I don't always have positive attitude towards squirrels, but they're still quite entertaining to watch. So just enjoying whatever it is that you are doing at the present time. It could even be just washing the dishes, enjoying washing the dishes, seeing them clean again. Uh, I attended a retreat led by Thich Nhat Hanh and his very, very close assistant is Sister Chan Kong. And there were breakout groups and I was in a breakout group that she led and she would sing a song and I can't sing it. I can't tell you the exact words, but it was when something like, when I'm washing the dishes, I am happy. When I'm cleaning the house, I am happy. When I'm in the bathroom, I am happy. And you know, going through all these different everyday situations that we're in and talking about, well, be happy while you're doing it. We always have that opportunity to be happy. I like to add a little bit of humor. And there are a lot of things to be humorous about in life, in the world. The world is full of humorous situations. Our mind is full of humorous thoughts. Here is one I was doing a month-long shamatha retreat. And to the third week, I was getting kind of bored doing the same thing over and over again. And, well, actually, it's a sign that something is happening when you're bored, when you meditate. You know, you're no longer being entertained by your thoughts. And so I had a thought which was, well, what about the Second World War? I could have thought about that for the whole rest of the retreat. And, of course, when that entered my mind, I laughed and, you know, let go of it. We have these silly thoughts. I remember another part of that retreat was, off in the distance, you heard a helicopter. And then it got louder and louder and louder and louder, and then it's overhead, and by this time the whole shrine room is full of people laughing so hard they're falling off their cushions. And then it passed over, and then everybody got composed and went back to meditating. Fine. Another attitude that is really very, very helpful. You might say water these flowers that we want to bloom. And that is gratitude, that there's so much in life that comes our way that involves other people. There's almost nothing that comes our way that doesn't involve other people, whether it be the food you eat. It's really easy to complain about poor roads in this part of the country. The winters do a lot of damage to the roads. Well, we've got roads. Go over to India and then compare. I was in India one time and we were in a kind of like an SUV here, only it didn't have the sports. <laughs> Just a utility vehicle, I think is a better word for it. The driver was Hindu. We got to this one part of the road. He stopped and started praying before he got further. 
you don't have to do that, at least in most places in this country when you're driving. And this spot deserved to be prayed before going further because it was very dangerous. It was in the mountains and it had been a landslide and there was no pavement and there was a cliff that went down about 500 feet into a monsoon swollen raging river. So gratitude, there's just so much that we can be grateful for. Just so much. Anything that you buy in the store, other people had to produce it. The Zoom, you know, the people had to produce the technology to do this. There are people that, uh, unsung people that are producing the electricity for this. And my device was probably made in China and on and on and on. That uh, interdependence, there's a long list of connections making all of this possible. Well, how about the Dharma? That Kempo Karta Rinpoche brought the Dharma to KTD and the, the monastery Woodstock area. 16 Karmapa was responsible for sending Kempo Karta Rinpoche here. And, you know, you can go right back to the Buddha with the interconnections that brought the conditions that let us come in contact with the Dharma and then be present for this talk. If you start thinking about it, you're going to have an endless list of things to be grateful for. The next is generosity. Generosity is very important, and it can be as simple as just listening to another person doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. Or just being present. Just being there and maybe saying nothing, just being present. And of course, if you want to give some money or an object or something, that's fine too. But the idea is that you are doing something for another person and your motivation is you want to benefit them in some way or another. Another very positive emotion is forgiveness. If you feel a person has caused you harm, wronged you in some way or another, to, to let go of it. I like to, to talk about forgiveness as the root word of forgiveness is give. And one is to, to give up, to, to give up holding it against the person. You, of course, keep. You, you remind yourself that you're not going to get, shall we say, harmed by that person a second time. And the world is full of scammers, needless to say, and all kinds of other, you know, you probably keep your house locked, take your car keys with you when you park your car. It isn't being totally ignorant, but it is not holding grudges and just letting go. So giving up Maybe give that person that you feel has harmed you a little compassion, giving them something. And of course, probably the most difficult person to forgive is ourselves. Giving ourselves, letting go of the things that we keep holding against ourselves. Another very important state of mind is being less judgmental. That um, trying to see without putting a, a lot of judgment in them that 
having a spacious mind, I believe is a good way to put this, just keeping your mind open, seeing clearly, but don't rush to conclusions that things uh, can look very differently. Again, like the story of the bag of trash. You really don't know something could happen and suddenly what you were judging turns out to be totally incorrect. So be curious, keep your eyes open and avoid rushing to judgment.